So at the end of the North American continent, the first public highway to the Arctic Ocean is being built. The Canadian government is spending 300 million Canadian dollars to build a highway which will connect Inuvik, the regional hub, to Tuxiatuk, a largely indigenous hamlet on the coastline. For years, the project, which has been approved by former Canadian Prime Minister Stephen Harper, has talked a lot about how the road will be a stimulus for social and economic development in the north. And indeed, in the Arctic, roads are everything. Tuck has no overland connection to the rest of Canada except for a seasonal winter road. So this road, once finished, will allow supplies and groceries to, to be brought in at much lower cost. Yet the highway, which we can see here from space, will also um, enhance access to the offshore oil and gas deposits, which were last heavily explored in the 70s and 80s. So I was really skeptical about the notion of whether this highway will enhance quality of life for people at North. So last summer I flew to Nubik and conducted interviews with lots of local people. And you can see here this landscape is completely underlaid by permafrost, which is fast thawing. And that thaw is already jeopardizing the longevity of the highway before it's even finished. Despite these rapid climatic shifts, road rollers are already out busy paving the tundra into a highway which will be finished sometime th um, this year or, or sometime ne next year in 2018. And you can see it here undulating across the tundra, skirting these rivers and gravel pits which have been extracted to lay down the gravel bed on top of the permafrost. And there's a lot of fish in these lakes which are really important for the local indigenous population. So in some ways, it's possible to think about this highway as a kind of extension of the Canadian federal government up north, continuing past colonial practices to really access and extract Arctic resources for consumption here in the south. But, and this may be true in a certain sense, so speaking with government officials, they have little tubes of oil on their desks, which are a testament to the past successes of Canada in extracting fossil fuels from the depths of the Arctic Ocean. But at the same time, I was surprised to find that the road holds a lot of local significance for people who really are actually quite in favor of this development that many of us might, from our vantage point, see as a kind of scar in the landscape. So in between time spent um, laying out beluga whale meat to dry, in between church potlucks and speaking with hunters and trappers, I found that for them the road is really a source of hope for a new type of economic development that will occur in a region which has long suffered from a lot of economic malaise. Since the last oil and gas development ended in the 80s, there's been just not really a lot going on in Tuktoyaktik. People like hunters and trappers are, of course, concerned with the pollution and the side effects of the road's construction, but they're hoping that better days lie ahead. One example that could come from this is perhaps um, a new hotel which could replace this abandoned hotel that sat there for many years now. Um, new supplies could be brought in to replace homes that are molding and filled with asbestos. Perhaps even the children's playground in Tuck, which is not the most exciting site. In fact, a lot of, some children are rumored to play in this abandoned oil rig, which just floats aimlessly offshore in a sort of, site of, in a sort of scene from Mad Max Arctic Edition. They hopefully could get a much better playground if once this road is built and people and trucks can go up year-round. Other remnants from pa the past kind of better years are this uh, empty shipping container from a now-defunct Japanese shipping line that show how Tuktoyaktik was actually connected into the global economy well before this road was even built. So this road is sort of a, a, a hope that maybe Tuck can once again be connected in a permanent way to the rest of the world. So once the road is finished, there's also this idea that tourism will be able to be developed in this corner of the Arctic, since this will be the first public highway. So there's the hope that um, young people will be able to drive up in their RVs and their trucks up the existing Dempster Highway from the mountains down the Yukon in southern Canada and make the way up the road to dip their toe in the Arctic Ocean, so to speak. So the highway has a lot of ideas that people kind of envision, which I think are quite fascinating. So it's not just about oil and gas, and it's not just about climate change. They're thinking in a much more short-term kind of day-to-day, -day, what are the economic potential, what's the economic potential that can come from this road? So at the end of the day, people in the Arctic are probably people like us, where it's really the economy stupid. So people are building this sort of infrastructure like a new restaurant called the end of the road. But I think what we kind of have to think about is, well, what is really going to be the end of this road in the longer term? Could it end up being what some people call the world's longest boat launch? And that's because I was able to conduct my interviews in a beach chair sitting in the Arctic Ocean in 85 degree weather. So it was warmer that day than in my home in Los Angeles. So even though this road will bring short-term economic benefits, and it already has in the way of new jobs for local people, as the Northwest Government and the Canadian Gov Northwest Territories Government in Canada consider building new roads, 
we have to wonder whether this is really the smartest investment for long-term community growth in the Arctic. Thank you.